Construction Veterans Affairs and Related Agencies Subcommittee is called to order. This is a fully virtual hearing and I appreciate um, everyone accommodating the last minute change. And so we'll need to address a few housekeeping matters. For today's meeting, the chair or staff designated by the chair may mute participants' microphones when they are not under recognition for the purposes of eliminating inadvertent background noise. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. If I notice when you are recognized that you have not unmuted yourself, I will ask the staff to send you a request to unmute yourself. Please then accept that request so you are no longer muted. I remind all members and witnesses that the five minute clock still applies. If there is a technology issue, we will move to the next member until the issue is resolved and you will retain the balance of your time. You will notice a clock on your screen that will show how much time is remaining. At one minute remaining, the clock will turn to yellow. When your time has expired, the clock will turn to red and I will begin to recognize the next member. In terms of the speaking order, we will follow the order that has set forth in the House rules, beginning with the chair and ranking member, then members present at the time the hearing is called to order will be recognized in order of seniority, alternating between majority and minority, and finally members not present at the time the hearing is called to order. Finally, House rules require me to remind you that we have set up an email address to which members can send anything they wish to submit in writing at any of our hearings. That email address has been provided in advance to your staff. Today, I'm pleased to welcome back the Honorable Dennis McDonough, Secretary of Veteran Affairs. We are glad to have you here with us today to discuss the department's budget request for fiscal year 2023 and how we can best serve our nation's veterans. Let me start by saying how encouraged I was to see that this budget continues investments in some of the areas this subcommittee has been extremely interested in, such as medical research, mental health, and women's health. I'm also pleased <clears throat> I'm also pleased to see that VA is requesting more funding to support veterans exposed to toxic substances during their service by increasing research, evaluating available data, and allocating <sighs> and allocating more resources to address veteran claims for health conditions resulting from toxic exposures. At the same time, VA is undertaking <sighs> forgive me, I'm having some technical difficulty here. At the same time, VA is undertaking a number of significant department-wide initiatives to help improve the delivery of care, such as significant investments in VA physical infrastructure to build and maintain modern facilities and the continued implementation of a new electronic health record system. It is incumbent upon us to make sure that our appropriations to the department and our oversight activities address these efforts in a thoughtful, reasonable way. While VA's budget request includes large increases across the department, Certainly the most significant piece of this request is the skyrocketing cost of veterans medical care. We all agree on the importance of providing care for our veterans, but this ever increasing number is crowding out other programs that benefit veterans, both at VA and across the federal government. So I look forward to discussing how we can account for this funding in order to give VA the tools to continue to provide world-class medical care to our veteran population. This is without question a critical time for the department as we continue to recover from the pandemic and address the backlogs of veteran claims, services, and medical care that have built up over the past two years. The additional funding that Congress provided last year in the American Rescue Plan Act enabled VA to respond to the pandemic and its ripple effects. For example, VA was able to process a historic number of claims using American Rescue Plan funding. And I'm proud to say that in fiscal year 2022, Congress provided a record amount of funding for VA to help ensure the prompt processing of veteran claims and to continue reducing the claims backlog. That investment will help VA continue its progress <coughs> and we hope to see similarly impressive results. There are a number of areas where I am eager to discuss how the funding requested in this budget will help VA provide quality, efficient, timely healthcare and benefits to veterans and their families. I look forward to hearing from the secretary about the department's priorities. And I'm now pleased to yield to our ranking member, Judge Carter for his opening statement. Judge? Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, last night I talked to my wife and she wanted me to tell you she's wishing you a quick recovery from your illness. So am I and we're praying for you. Thank you very much. You get well soon. Thank you. You're a real trooper, but you always are. Um, welcome, Secretary Donald. We're, we're glad to have you with us. Oh, when we met last April, I believe it was, to discuss the, the VA's FY22 budget request, I remarked that its 82% increase was not the largest I'd seen, but still quite large. This year, 99.7% increase for discretionary programs 
along with 7.5 billion for the second bite is another eye-popping request. While the year, year after year you've given increases, it may have been substantial. We need to look at the big picture. In FY18, the overall budget has increased, since that time it has increased 53%. This is an increase of 104 billion from 197.4 to 301.4 billion, not counting emergency funding. If expansive environmental exposure legislation is enacted, this will add an additional 400 billion to the VA's budget over 10 years. For some time, Congress and the administration have discussed how to appropriate appropriately budget for veterans programs. This year, the president has proposed to treat veterans health care as a separate category of spending. What exactly this means needs to be fully fleshed out. At a time when we're spending trillions of other domestic programs outside of the appropriations process. We should be more able to take care of our patients, veterans, than the normal top line allocations. I am not yet convinced the new spending category is necessary or advisable. I look forward to hearing the administration's rationale. I'm honored to serve the veterans and my taxpaying constituents. Together, we need to ensure VA uses its funding to deliver quality, quality health care, efficiency in processing claims, to provide for burials, and respectfully, respectful resting places, while meeting our other domestic and defense needs. I want to encourage you to, at the VA to continue the Congressional Fellowship Program. The VA, the VA Fellow provides critical insight to congressional offices and quickly becomes a valued addition to our staffs. Sheree Oliver is our VA Fellow this year, and she's a real asset to my constituents an essential member of Team Carter. I'm very happy to have her. Mr. Secretary, thank you again for being here. Madam Chairman, I appreciate the time and I yield back. Thank you, Judge Carter. <clears throat> and thank you for your for your get well wishes. I, I really appreciate it. And, and from your wife as well. Um, Secretary McDonough, uh, I, well, I, I don't think we have um, Ranking Member Granger here, and I know we'll be joined in a few minutes by um, by, ranking, by uh, Chair Deloro, um, who I'll recognize after whatever member is, is speaking at the moment. Um, Secretary, Secretary McDonough, your full written testimony will be included in the record, and you are recognized for five minutes to summarize your opening statement. Member Carter and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Chairwoman, uh add please uh the mcdonough's prayers to uh the judges and and his wives uh for your uh rapid recovery i want to say to the subcommittee uh thank you very much for uh your leadership in passing the omnibus and for including in it the raise act which will be instrumental in keeping va's fantastic nurses and physician assistants at va caring for vets where they belong i'd like to begin with a story about one of those nurses paula Solaire. Early in the pan pandemic, Paula became the lead nurse for a young veteran diagnosed with COVID-19. This vet's case was bad. He couldn't breathe on his own, so he was immediately put a on a respirator when he arrived at the hospital. Unfortunately, due to safety restrictions, this young vet's family couldn't visit him in person. So from that moment on, Paula took it upon herself to not only care for him, but to keep him in contact with his wife and one-year-old child. 
Every morning and evening, no matter what, Paula sat with his veteran and FaceTimed his family. Then one day, when the veteran was really struggling, all of Paula's work culminated in a moment she'll never forget. During one of their FaceTime, FaceTimes, this veteran's wife said to her husband, if you hear me and love me, squeeze Paula's hand. Despite his dire condition, this young vet did exactly that, with tears streaming down his face. Largely thanks to Paula, that vet eventually pulled through. He became that hospital's first successful COVID extubation and discharge, and now he's home with his family, the family that Paula kept him connected to when it seemed like he might not make it. That's what fighting like hell for vets looks like, and that's what VA employees like Paula do every day and have done throughout this more than two years of pandemic. Their great work has led VBA to process more than 825 veteran claims already this fiscal year, the fastest pace in history. It's led NCA to a point where we're approaching our goal of providing 90%, 95% of vets with access to burial sites within 75 miles of their homes. And it's led VHA to a point where outpatient trust scores are above 90% and where studies show that we're delivering better outcomes than the private sector. All told, we're providing more care and more benefits to more veterans than ever before. But make no mistake, employees like Paula can't do that work unless they have the resources they need to do it. And that's why this budget is so important. It'll not only help us continue down this path, but empower us to do even better for vets, families, caregivers, and survivors. Specifically, this budget will help us get 38,000 vet homeless veterans into permanent housing by the end of this calendar year. It will help us deliver the toxic exposure benefits that veterans deserve as fast as possible by researching military exposures, hiring claims processors, and investing in claims automation. It will help us save veterans from dying by suicide by expanding the veteran crisis line, getting ready to deploy the 988 line, investing in lethal means safety and funding local intervention programs. It will help us deliver for all vets, including women veterans, our fastest growing demographic by investing the highest amount ever in our women's health program, which delivers tailored world-class healthcare to women vets and works to ensure that all women vets feel welcome, safe, and respected at VA. It'll help us save lives by investing nearly a billion dollars in VA's groundbreaking research, including long COVID and cancer research. And it'll help us invest in our workforce, providing the money we need to recruit and retain VA's great employees. I could go on and on, but the bottom line is this. The number you see when you look at this budget request is 301.4 billion. But what this budget really means is health care for an estimated 9.2 million vets, disability and survivor benefits for an estimated 6 million vets and their families, and lasting resting places for an estimated 135,000 heroes and family members. What this budget really means is veterans' lives saved or improved by the work this funding makes possible. The president often repeats a quote from his dad saying, show me your budget and I'll tell you what, your val what you value. Well, this budget shows how deeply this president and our country values veterans, their families, caregivers, and survivors. These heroes are the backbone of America. They deserve our very best. And with this budget, that's exactly what we'll give them. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify and for your steadfast, steadfast support of veterans and VA. I look very much forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Secretary, and thank you for your well wishes. Um, we appreciate your remarks. We'll proceed in the standard five-minute rounds, recognizing members in order of seniority as they were seated at the beginning of the hearing, alternating between majority and minority. Please be mindful of your time and allow the witnesses time to answer within your five-minute turn. Mr. Secretary, uh, thank you for your, your overview. And I, I just want to say that there really are uh, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of good news in this budget. But we, we can't ignore really what is the elephant in the room, and I, I know you know this, and that's the ever-growing cost of veterans' medical care. This year's budget requests $118.7 billion for VA medical care, which is a 22% increase over last year's enacted level. And of that funding, a whopping $7.5 billion is a second bite on top of what was already provided through advanced funding. 
and you're requesting $128 billion in advance funding for FY24, which is another $9.4 billion increase. Mr. Secretary, we, I know we've talked about this in the past, um, but it's important to sort of hash this out here um, publicly. What's the long-term plan here? I mean, clearly we, we must provide for our veterans healthcare and we all are passionate about that. That's part of serving on this committee. But if we're gonna keep seeing these exponential increases year after year, we need to build a consensus on an allocation adjustment so that other discretionary priorities are not affected, including the non-healthcare priorities within VA. VA. So in, in light of the new, new the administration's top new top line display, which I hope was, uh, was, was a sign, um, of defense, non-defense, and VA medical pro care programs, breaking those out. Is that a signal that the administration would support an allocation adjustment? And what's your um, sense of how we're going to deal with this burgeoning problem? Yeah, uh, Chairwoman, thanks very much for the question. Uh, let me work backwards on those. One, yes, it's very much a signal that we would uh, uh, support a separate allocation. We, I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, VA, frankly, is nested within uh, the interagency uh, budget and for us to continue to grow at the rates that we're growing uh, and uh, that coming at the expense of the rest of the non-defense discretionary uh, makes us less effective overall than we might otherwise be. Uh, so I thought it was a very uh, important innovation uh, from the White House, from the OMB, uh, to uh, separate veterans health care. I think it does lift it up as we do the defense budget as a standalone. Point two, the second bite. I know this is a source of great frustration. I have to tell you that the two-year advanced appropriation for us is an extraordinarily helpful uh, innovation. So we're grateful for that. And I also recognize that it, it causes challenges for you and for your teams. That said, because it's a two-year uh, assessment estimation, there's inevitably going to be variation uh, like the type that we're seeing. Uh, I want us to uh, continue to work through to get better at that. We're looking at the model. We're talking to you and your teams about the model to see where we can get it better. We're talking to OMB as well, and we'll continue that. Lastly, on the overall uh, increases in the budget, especially in the medical care account, um, this is a function of uh, three things. One is health inflation across the, uh, the, uh, the country, which is a, has been now for years a real challenge. Okay. Two, uh, the fact that our veterans are increasingly reliant on and uh, coming to us for more complex care. Uh, and three, this is a vote of confidence in VA. We're seeing that in a lot of different ways, but this is a sign of demand at VA, and that's because I think VA does better for veterans when they're in our care than they, uh, than they do and then when they fare outside of our care. Uh, so I know it's a source of frustration. We'll continue to be very transparent with you. Uh, and you know, through things like preventative services, through things like making sure that we keep and maintain the experts that we have, I think we can bring that number down over time. <clears throat> Thank you, um, Mr. Secretary. You know, I don't want to even cast this whole issue of the need for increased uh, spending on veterans' health care as a negative. I mean, we know we need and want to take care of our veterans. It, it, it just, the, the frustration is really over the challenge, uh, and, and the challenge is, is something that, you know, is just part of our responsibility, and so working together is really important. Members, we're gonna have a second round because I know usually at this hearing, we, uh, we all have questions we can't get to. Um, but I do wanna ask the secretary about the second bite because it's seven and a half billion dollars and it's a pretty significant increase over what was provided in advance for this year, particularly compared to the second bites we've seen requested in previous years. What would these funds be put toward and why would these activities be funded out of FY23's second bite instead of FY24's advance? And, you know, if I put it another way, is any of the second bite for new initiatives versus needed adjustments to estimates? And, and do you anticipate that FY24 will have as high a second bite, or is this an aberration? Yeah, so thanks. I, I, I Look, I hope it's an aberration, um, but uh, we'll, we'll continue to work very closely with you, as I said, both on uh, the uh, on our assessments, but also on any changes that come along. That's one. Two, uh, there, we are uh, having to move certain in, uh, investments that we've made 
uh, with CARES Act money, for example, into uh, base budget. So uh, hires that we were able to make early in the pandemic, uh, investment in new uh, technology that needs to be maintained over time. Uh, so that's part of what you see in here. Um, and again, recognizing that these are two year out assessments, it does a, uh, present a certain degree of variability uh, that unfortunately, especially with healthcare inflation being what it has been now over the course of the last 15 years, uh, creates new challenges for us. But again, I agree with you that the answer here, this is, I, I see this as a vote of, uh, of, a vote of confidence from veterans in our care, uh, but we just have to continue to maintain our transparency with you as, as these uh, changes come along. Thank you. And, and just to finish my, my second bite focus here for yeah. a second, um, the medical facilities second bite is a billion and a half dollars, and that's significantly higher than we've seen in prior years. And so unlike the second bite for medical services and community care, this is not an adjustment based on an actuarial model. Um, right. it, it increases support for new maintenance projects. So can you help us understand why the second bite request for medical facilities is critical and why the 7.1 billion that Congress provided in advance FY23 is no longer adequate for that? Yeah, so remember that during the course of the last two years, we've had to uh, invest significantly in our facilities uh, to make them uh, more ready for the pandemic. So take, for example, zero pressure rooms, uh, which we didn't have uh, any of, but which are critical to maintaining um, the isolation required for a COVID uh, positive vet. So those investments need to be maintained. So that's why you see in the second bite that money uh, in the facilities account. Um, again, this is uh, directly responsive to the challenges presented to us by the pandemic. Uh, that's an example of it, as I say, the zero pressure rooms. Uh, and as if we see more of that, we'll make sure that we stay close to you on that. But that's the kind of thing that if you, you know, to your earlier question, is this aberration or one time, you know, slash one time funding, or is this something new uh, that's going to come back again? I think this is a one time uh, increase necessary. Yeah, hope, we just have to stay in close coordination and hopefully with the that this is pandemic related and, and yes. get this uh, get get this get past this. Um, Judge Carter, um, if you don't mind, we've been joined by Chair DeLauro, who I, I would like to recognize at this time, and then I'll come back to you. Ch Chair DeLauro, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you very, very much, uh, Judge Carter. I'm chairing Labor HHS at the same time, so we're all running back and forth. I really appreciate this, and welcome, Secretary McDonough. Thank you so much for the testimony uh, 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 today. Um, uh, uh, just last week, I held a forum with veterans in, in my district to talk about information on the resources we included in the omnibus, uh, the legislation through this subcommittee. Uh, and the issue, uh, and hearing from them the issues that they face on a daily basis. One of the topics uh, was about backlog faced by the Veterans Benefits Administration. Uh, in the omnibus, we included $3.5 billion for operating expenses for the Veterans Benefit Administration, uh, funding that will support the work to decrease the claims backlog. Um, and as of January, it was reported that there were over 260,000 claims in VA's backlog, up from 70,000 backlog cases prior to the pandemic. I understand the agency has made strides to reduce the backlog. You mentioned the technology that the VA will provide to support automating the disability compensation claims process. Can you describe in more detail how you plan to get the numbers down? Um, um, uh, anyway, why don't I ask you to... Uh, uh, describe your plans about getting the backlog down. I think you're on mute, sec Mr. Secretary. Okay, I think Thank I'm you. mute. Yeah, okay, I'm live here. Yeah. Do you have me now? Yes, yes. Great. Yes. Um, so, uh, Chairwoman, thank you very much. Uh, I uh, thanked the uh, subcommittee earlier for the omnibus, which is very generous to us, especially the inclusion of the RAISE Act, which is really, really important to our nurses. Uh, and our uh, nursing assistants and our uh, uh, several other categories of our people. So thank you very much for that. Right now, as of uh, yesterday, the backlog is at 236,000 claims. 
Uh, this year, fiscal year to date, we have processed 830,000 claims. That's the fastest to 830,000 in the history of VBA. Uh, the challenge is that we have received 840,000 claims this year. Uh, those are claims uh, that include several uh, uh, claims related to Agent Orange that Congress enacted uh, year before last. It includes Blue Water Navy, and it includes uh, President Biden's uh, insistence that we begin to address toxic exposure claims as the first president in 30 years of war in Southwest Asia to do that. So our uh, plan to uh, bring that number down includes uh, three very uh, uh, significant steps. First, through the ARP funding that you gave us, we are still able to pay overtime for claims adjusters, so uh, claims examiners. So we are working over time to bring that number down. And in fact, that number is coming down, especially for things like the Blue Water Navy, such that we think we might be able to beat uh, the uh, target of the end of this year that we had had on the books to complete those claims. The second thing we're, do, it, we're doing is we are hiring additional personnel. Using last year's money, we began hiring nearly 2,100 additional people. 70% uh, of them are hired, and 90% of the people that we have hired, so 90% of the 70%, are in training or have completed training. There's a tail on claims personnel to get them uh, to a productive level. We think it's between six and nine months, so we're moving that on the new hires. So over time, new hires. Third is uh, automating, and uh, sorry, this budget for FY23 gives us authority to hire another uh, more than 300 additional claims processors. Mm -hmm. So we continue that process that we're under underway now into FY23. Mm -hmm. Last, we want to modernize the process itself. We're looking very closely at whether there are things, steps in the process that we can consolidate, uh, or that we can remove altogether. For example, need we have additional examinations for every filing? Mm -hmm. The other uh, modernization we're looking at is automation. We have not. We have a goal of this year to automate three new conditions each quarter. Our most recent addition is claims for asthma. We've only had a handful of those in. But some of those claims are resolved as quickly as in one day, rather than over that, rather than uh, in over several weeks. So if this technology bears out in the way that we hope it will, and that it is beginning to show that it can, we think we can uh, reduce the time to per claim uh, going forward. So those are the three steps, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Okay, I thank you very very much, and I just wanted to just say this is very critically important to us. And as we look at uh, uh, opportunities in which we will look at those toxic chemicals like burn pits, et cetera, we know that there's going to be an increased number of, of, yeah. of, 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 of cases, of applications, et cetera. Uh, so we need to keep close attention to this. And with that, I will yield back and again say thank you uh, to the chair uh, for recognizing me. And I want to uh, say thank you uh, for your graciousness, Judge Carter. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, appreciate it. The gentlelady yields back. You go get them at, uh, at Labor H. At Labor H, <laughs> right. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Judge Carter, you're recognized for five minutes or you know, uh, such time as you may consume. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, the um, FY23 budget request proposes to separate veterans health care from non-defense discretionary spendings. We just talked about that. Exactly how will this work? Is there a specific legislative proposal? What is the president's rationale for the change? Won't this just increase the amount of funding available for other non-defense discretionary programs? Is that spending justified, especially given the 6.4% increase 
provided in FY22. What trillions we spend on mandatory side of the ledger, is it a good idea to allow more spending on the discretionary side? Series of questions. Judge, th thank you very much, Judge, um, and uh, I appreciate your uh, all your partnership uh, with the department, um, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, as to whether there's a specific legislative proposal, uh, I, I I believe there is, but I'll, I'll confess to you, Judge, I don't I have not seen it, uh, so I'll get an answer to you on that, and I'll come to you back come back to you on that express question after consult, uh, consulting with the OMB uh, director. Second, why do it? Well, I think there's three reasons. One is, uh, as I said before, um, I think it makes sense to separate this uh, from the broader account to underscore, as we do with defense, the unique nature and the unique importance of investments in veteran health. That's the first reason. The second reason is I do think that um, it uh, risks undercutting our ability if we keep it uh, consolidated with the non-defense discretionary. It, redu it, redu it risks reducing the effectiveness of VA within the interagency on things like the pandemic, where we have worked very, very closely with our partners at HHS. And so making sure that it does not the important investments in veterans do not come at the expense of other investments in the federal government, non-defense discretionary, on which we also rely for veterans' health, is a uh, positive. Third, I also think um, that our investment in veteran health care uh, does uh, actually look and act a little bit like mandatory investments reflected elsewhere in the government, because uh, this is something that veterans come to rely on. It is something that increasingly veterans are satisfied with. And we believe, especially if Congress continues uh, with this important effort on toxic exposure legislation, uh, it could end up being an important amount of additional enrollees coming uh, into VA. Lastly, I hope and I welcome that uh, when this is set aside as a standalone account, that that engenders even greater scrutiny of our practices and how we invest that money. Uh, I endeavor to be very transparent with uh, the committee, with you, uh, Judge Carter, with uh, Chairman Wasserman Schultz. Uh, I would anticipate that as a standalone account, we, we would engender even greater scrutiny uh, I welcome that as a challenge for us to be even more transparent with the committee. Well, mandatory spending right now is uh, uh, driving us over the cliff. If we don't do something about our current mandatory spending, the projection is sometime in the early 30s, we're going to go over the financial cliff. It could change the very nature of life in the United States. So to set up a situation where we may inadvertently be creating more mandatory spending to me is not a good idea. Uh, everybody always treats VA like it's mandatory anyway. I think both sides of the aisle do. Uh, we may not like it, but we do treat it that way. But it's not. And if we add it, it is mandatory. It just means more things that doesn't have the oversight of what we do in our committee, and therefore just moves us closer to that time when we can't pay our bills. So if that's what we're trying to do, set up a situation where VA spending is mandatory, all of it, quite frankly, uh, that's a bad program as far as I'm concerned. And thank you for your answer. This thank you, Judge. I yield back. Thanks, Judge. Um, yeah, I think we're going to just have to have a, a deeper dive conversation on on how we're going to approach this in the future. We we really just have some challenges that that have to be addressed, 
and we can't just keep kicking the can down the road. So I appreciate the opportunity given the president's proposal to, to foster that discussion. <laughs> Forgive me. Um, next, next up is, uh, is Congresswoman Lee. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, sorry, I was not expecting that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and I'd like to thank the Secretary for being here. Um, Secretary, I've been hearing some con significant concerns from veterans in my district about recent recommendations from the Asset and Infrastructure Review Commission uh, for facility closures. And a specific concern is the, clo the recommendation of a closure for the Laughlin Rural Outreach Clinic. Uh, in Southern Nevada, this clinic has provided health care to thousands of veterans um, in what is really an under-resourced community. Uh, and, um, you know, while I appreciate uh, the administration's efforts, um, I just wanted to make you aware that this community, just so you know, uh, I want to paint a picture. It would ask veterans who now receive uh, care within their community to take transportation across the bridge into Arizona to Bullhead City. And uh, this is no small task for veterans who are seriously ill or disabled or lack the adequate transportation. And so um, I'm sure we can all agree that we don't want to create additional barriers for veterans to access care. Um, with that in mind, I just have some questions about this proposal, uh, which I sent a letter to you and the president on March 18th. Uh, in assessing these recommendations, how will the VA ensure that veterans uh, in community see continued improvements to health care access, especially if they lack transportation and the broadband connection for telehealth? Uh, you need to unmute, sec Mr. Secretary. I think I'm, um, yeah, sorry, I'm not managing the mute button here, sorry. Um, Thank you very much for the question and thank you for the letter which i reviewed very closely uh and obviously talking to our team about it um the 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 f fact is we're early in this process these are recommendations the commission uh once the senate acts will get to uh, take a hard look at it uh i think there is i think you raise a very interesting point that we are developing programming on which is transportation we had a, a legislative request this could, kind of takes it from the future to the present. We had a legislated, uh, legislative request for last year on dramatically increasing uh, the rural transportation program that we manage. We have the funding for that this year. We'd like to get the authority uh, for that. I think that'll end up being important for a lot of rural uh, communities. Um, the third thing I'd like to say is um, we, obviously we, inherited when we arrived this data collection effort going back to 2018 and 2019 when it started much of the data on which the decisions were made predates the pandemic i think that's a mistake uh however the statute being what the statute is there was not an option for me to stop this program so what we will do is we will update the data on which those recommendations is, are based and give that to the commission during the course of its proceedings, I would encourage you to do the same about what you're hearing from your veterans. And I'd encourage you, I would encourage the commission also to make sure that they get to Southern Nevada to hear from the veterans there. Uh, lastly, the whole set of recommendations are designed to try to get more care in a more updated fashion in more modern facilities closer to our veterans. It sounds like that we did not hit the mark uh, in Southern Nevada with this proposal that vets travel to Bullhead City. Um, I'm happy to take a relook at this and I think we ought to make sure that the commission itself takes a look at it. And then the president has a, de a decision to make as well at the end of the day. Remember, these are my recommendations to the president. The president gets to take a fresh look at these after hearing from you and the commission and others about whether to proceed with them or not. And then ultimately you guys get the same, the same decision. Great. Well, thank you, um, Mr. Secretary. I'm pleased that you'll take that into consideration. It's uh, been something, you know, 
as soon as you recommend a closure, you tend to start to hear uh, just how important no. knowledge is. But it's it's been a clinic that has been uh, really a lifeline in that community. So I appreciate yeah. uh, you taking another look at it. Thank you, and yeah. I yield. I'll just say one thing, uh, Ms. Lee and, and Chairwoman uh, and Judge Carter. Uh, what we see in reaction to the recommendation so far, good and bad, is a desire for more access to VA healthcare. Uh, that's a reassuring thing, in my view. Um, and I, I'd be the first to admit that I may not have gotten every recommendation correct here, but I am gratified to see the demand for greater access uh, from our veterans. I think that's a vote of confidence in our care providers, and I'm proud of them as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Secretary and Ms. Lee. The gentlelady yields back. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Secretary, Mr. Secretary, for, yes, uh, for being at this hearing. You've been you've been a pleasure to work with. Your team has been great yeah. to work with. Uh, my, my first question is, last year, this committee appropriated $150 million to construct a new VA uh, health care center in El Paso, Texas. Uh, this year, I look forward to finalizing that project. Can we? Can you provide an update on the next steps for this project? Yes, absolutely, uh, Mr. Gonzalez. Thanks very much, and thank you for your partnership. You're always available to us, and and uh, we've appreciated the ability to lean on your uh, cyber expertise too as we wrestle with that challenge. Uh, we we believe that El Paso is a uh, groundbreaking uh, new way for us to get uh, construction done more quickly, uh, speed to market. So the $150 million allowed us to do the uh, initial site preparation for that building where we'll provide additional services building on the existing VA healthcare center in El Paso, uh, including uh, mental health services. Um, we uh, anticipate in this budget another $550 million to complete uh, the uh, construction of that facility. Uh, well, from uh, soup to nuts, we anticipate this being a 51-month uh, project. Uh, we want to continue to hold ourselves to those timelines, the next timeline being uh, when the $150 million you gave us uh, last year that we're currently investing over the course of this year, that $550 million we anticipate beginning in April 2023. And then uh, we anticipate uh, finishing in 2026 with the new facility. That's 51 months soup to nuts. We think that's uh, much faster than we've done in the past. And we think that's the, the, uh, kind of a pilot for us being able to speed to market uh, the kind of care that we need, including in a growing uh, community like El Paso, where we're seeing uh, significant demand from new vets. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Once again, appreciate you prioritizing it. As you know, uh, veterans are growing in Texas, in particular, West Texas is an area of need that has been uh, uh, long forgotten. So appreciate your leadership on that. Uh, my next question is in regards to the border. So uh, Mr. Secretary, as you know, my district spans more than 40% of the Southern border. Throughout this migrant crisis, the communities I represent have been overwhelmed by record number of apprehensions that continue to happen in my, my backyard. Uh, this response is only expected to accelerate. Just last week, the Biden administration announced it will be ending Title 42 on May 23rd. This change will multiply the number of migrants encountered uh, that we see daily. As a result, there are reports that DHS has approached DOD with a request to assist in a contingency plan to deal with the fallout of Title 42 at the border and the record number of migrants that we expect to see. There are reports that the VA that VA medical personnel will be dispatched to vaccinate migrants as they make their way into the US. Can you confirm these conversations and offer any further guidance on how the VA will be utilized in this border crisis? Yeah, thanks very much, Mr. Gonzalez. There, uh, I'm not aware of any such conversations. I've seen the news reports. Uh, there's uh, no, I, I can't find any evidence of the conversations. I would say this. Uh, over the course of the pandemic, uh, at least since I've been here, uh, we have deployed uh, VA healthcare personnel to support other federal partners, including our federal law enforcement partners, uh, where we uh, administered vaccine uh, to CBP and ICE personnel. And so maybe that's the um, uh, 
maybe that's the basis of some of the the rumor uh, that you're referring to, but I'm not aware of any such conversations. I'm proud of the uh, role that we've played in supporting our uh, federal partners, CBP, ICE, U.S. Capitol Police, um, uh, Bureau of Prisons, uh, I anticipate will continue to do, uh, D, uh, you know, uh, transportation, TSA personnel, uh, I anticipate will continue to do that kind of work. Yeah, no, thank you for that response. And, and I, would, I would just offer, if there is anything that comes up, like you said, there's all these reports that are always out there. Uh, you know, if, if I can be included in, in I'm not. finding a way to be uh, uh, to help with this problem set, I want to be able to uh, to give the ground truth to what's happening. You know, you started off this this hearing giving a beautiful story about Paula uh, Paula and all the great work she does for the VA. Uh, I just don't want to see VA professionals pulled out of that role and get sucked up into a different role where we're seeing veterans kind of lose that quality of care. Uh, but, but like you mentioned, I think there's a way where you can absolutely be helpful to other agencies, just like you have been, uh, but there has to be a plan in place if and so that happens. So uh, I'm out of time, uh, but I will, I will yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Um, and you know, just for, for the public's benefit, the VA does have a fourth mission uh, mandate where they uh, provide value added whenever uh, it's potentially warranted. And so they've done an incredible job, particularly throughout uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And I appreciate that you're uh, recognizing the uh, the need to work with the department in the event that that their fourth mission for, for whatever potential reason needs to be implemented. Okay. Good point. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Chris, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, know that you're in my prayers and uh, hope you have a very speedy recovery, uh, thinking about you always. Uh, Secretary McDonough, thank you so much for joining us today. I uh, appreciate you. your presence and your um, service. Um, my office has a great relationship in my district with Bay Pines Hospital. Um, however, elsewhere in the VA, we have uh, continuing issues of non-responsiveness to the point that sometimes it seems like uh, almost deliberate attempts to make it more difficult to help my constituents. For example, I've been told uh, no information will be provided over the phone or by email to caseworkers, including just regular updates, uh, but that will require the use of physical mail, a process that can drag out for weeks or months when it could have been just a quick phone call or an email conversation. Uh, it's disturbing to me that in 2022, this is the way some VA offices would do business. Casework is something we all on this subcommittee do. And at the end of the day, it's about the veterans we represent, our bosses. Um, are there any uh, restrictions placed on VA offices and how they are allowed to communicate information to congressional caseworkers? And are VA offices allowed to communicate information over the phone or email to congressional caseworkers regarding active cases? Yeah, thanks very much, Mr. Christ. Uh, so I, I reached out to the uh, St. Pete regional office last night to uh, make sure that I understood what was happening there. Um, you know, uh, the regional office director, uh, who is one of our real high performers, and I both commit to you that if there's some, if there's a particular case, I hope you'll, that you're having trouble with that you'll raise it, your team will raise it with me or with her directly, we'll, we'll resolve that. Uh, as to the modalities by which we can communicate, uh, we uh, take incoming by phone, uh, by letter, by email, we communicate uh, same, that when we are providing PII, you know, uh, personally identifiable information, we do provide that encrypted uh, to uh, uh, over email. Uh, and so we're obviously able to work with you in that fashion as well and with your caseworkers. And so, again, if there's a specific set of cases that uh, we're hung up on, I hope we can just uh, roll up our sleeves and get at them. But there should be no um, limitation on the way we communicate with your caseworkers. Um, and surely, you know, in the, in the event we're dealing with personally identifiable information for a veteran, there we will need, obviously, a way to communicate that in an encrypted fashion, as I think you would expect. And I, I know we have ways to do that. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I appreciate your response very much. Um, like many of my constituents, I was thrilled to see our Blue Water Navy Vietnam veterans get access to the benefits they've earned. 
Unfortunately, we're still seeing their benefits being held up by some bureaucratic red tape. Uh, to the best of your ability, how many Blue Water veterans have received their benefits since they became eligible and how many claims have been denied? You know, that's a good, that's a reasonable question. I should know the answer uh, to uh, Mr. Christ. I don't have that information at, even in my thick briefing book here. So if I can take that one, I'll get you an answer by the end of the day. Okay, I appreciate that very much, Mr. Secretary, and I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great. I might just say one thing real quick, Madam Chair, uh, to Mr. Christ. Um, this is not specific data, which I'll get you by the end of the day, but I actually believe that because of the progress we've been able to make over the course of uh, the pandemic in getting digitized records, ship logs, and those types of things from NPRC, and digitizing those records, I think we are, and our ability to invest in overtime, as we have been doing thanks to the American Rescue Plan and other investments from you all, I, I we are ahead of schedule on completing the Blue Water Navy claims. Uh, about the, as it relates to the specifics, I'll get you those. And then my reaction to the first question stands, which is, if there's a specific case you're worried about, I hope you'll make sure that uh, uh, we get in touch with that vet and we'll, we'll get to the bottom of it. Yes, sir. Great. Thank you very much, Secretary. Appreciate it. Um, thank you, Mr. Chris. The gentleman yields back. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Mr. Videt Valadeo, uh, you'll recognize for five minutes. Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for your time today. I've really enjoyed working with you and uh, obviously getting to know you a little bit on the football field even this year. Looking forward to our next game coming up. Uh, a couple of different issues I wanted to talk about, though, is a community-based outpatient clinic in Bakersfield, California, still uh, hasn't been built. Um, it's been 11 years since Congress authorized its construction, but my veteran constituents in the Central Valley still uh, do not have an updated facility. I know this case has been riddled by bureaucracy and endless lawsuits. Um, and I know that your uh, department has been doing their best on this one, but this is one that thousands of veterans have been waiting um, some have even passed away, and I know the VA has been doing everything they possibly can to get this thing constructed, but I want to know if there's something that we need to do uh, through Congress, some legal uh, changes, some regulatory changes that both of us, one of us can do to make sure facilities like this get more uh, completed in a more timely manner, uh, and our veterans just don't have another decade to wait for this. Yeah. Uh, th thanks very much. I look very much forward to the football game too, and I'm going to stretch more so I don't hurt myself in the practices. Um, uh, I'm excited about the Bakersfield Seabock. Uh, I've talked to you about this. I've talked to uh, Mr. McCarthy about it. Uh, it does seem to me that what, uh, as I understand it, the issue here is uh, some legal wrangling. Um, you know, locally there on the ground, we're work doing our best to work through that. One thing, though, uh, in response to your question that I call your attention to is the way CBO requires, uh, the, the way we're required to clear uh, by legislated authorization every new lease we do, and then the way CBO scores those leases means that right now we're sitting on 31 leases uh, that we should be moving that we can't move because we don't have legislated uh, authorization yet. Again, because of the way CBO scores these things. So I talked to the Senate last week. Our hope is uh, as we move something like uh, toxic exposure leg uh, legislation, which may include, may result in as many as uh, 2 million additional enrollees uh, at VA uh, for VA healthcare, we need to fix this lease authorization question. Uh, the Senate indicated some interest in including such a fix in their version of a toxic exposure bill. At least we need to fix, get these 31 author, uh, leases that are pending done. And if we could even get a more permanent fix uh, so we can just get these leases uh, from soup to nuts so we can get vets into that kind of care would be really important. So that's the specific thing I'd like to ask your help on. Okay, well, we'll uh, be in touch so we can find a way to make that happen. Great. Uh, next question. A few weeks ago, the VA announced a pause on any expulsions from the caregiver support program. However, the VA has maintained the eligibility changes to the program are necessary to ensure financial solvency. 
the fiscal year 23 budget calls for a 30% increase to this budget to meet the current needs. Can you walk this committee through the process you're utilizing to determine the new criteria? And will you, will you be using the future caregiver support program enrollees? Do you anticipate another significant increase in this funding for this program in future budgets? Great. Uh, thank you. I'm really glad you asked about this. I think this is one of the most innovative and exciting things we're doing. I think the caregiver program, which Congress uh, conceived of, is a, is a really good idea. Um, we, you're right that uh, we said we would not uh, suspend anybody else uh, from the program pending a relook at the screen through which we run uh, the legacy participants. Uh, one. Two, uh, in all cases, anybody who has been told that they will not uh, qualify for the program uh, can, will continue to get the stipend until April 2023 in any case okay so no one stops receiving the stipend until earliest april 2023 so a full year from now that's point three point four we are looking at uh the second part of the two-part test that somebody needs to go through the first part of the test is did the injuries the veteran incurred the condition the veteran living with uh did that happen in war, in defense of the nation? That's in statute. That's a yes, no question. We use a proxy of whether a vet is 70% service connected to get through that test. We can't change that. That's legislated. The second part of the test is the percentage of activities of daily living. A veteran needs help from his caregiver or her caregiver to carry out. Uh, that is a regulatory hurdle. We are looking at now in consultation with caregivers, in consultation with uh, VSOs, with consultation in consultation with members of your staffs and staffs of the appropriations and authorizations committees, in House and Senate. We're looking at whether there is a way consistent with the statute for us to be more inclusive in that second test. We have not made a determination as to whether we'll issue new regulation. But if we're going to change it, we would have to issue new regulation. Uh, so we're working that through now. We're doing that, in, as I said, in consultation with VSOs and with you and your staffs. Uh, in all cases, once we establish the second part of this new test, whether we can do that with new regulation or need, can do that of our own accord, then we will run everybody back through that screen and make final determinations whether the legacy participants stay in the program or go. Even if they go, by the way, they continue to be uh, eligible for important caregiver programming for us, from us, not just, but not the stipend. Last point, October 1, we are determined to expand the caregiver program to all era of vets. Heretofore has been mostly in and around post 9-11 vets. Congress has given us authority to expand it to include vets going back to Korea. Uh, we will do that in October. We're uh, insistent on doing that. So we're going to get both pieces of this work done, getting the legacy cases reviewed in a more inclusive way and expanding the program back to uh, the Korea War vets. I hope that answers the question, Mr. Valdeo. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, my time is up, so I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Valadeo. The gentleman yields back. Mr. Case, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. First of all, thank you for your efforts in my part of the world, uh, Hawaii and the broader Pacific. Uh, we, of course, share the same uh, concerns as the rest of the country, the same goals, but it gets a little more complicated or at least a little bit more varied when you leave the uh, the west coast of, of the continental United States, at least, uh, and get out into the tyranny of distance and yes. and the, the the question of how you handle island jurisdictions uh, versus uh, you know being able to drive down the road 100 miles. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to say a thanks because we have many issues with you and uh, we've enjoyed the partnership. Uh, we Thank are excited you. about a, a brand new um, outpatient clinic, uh, the Aloha Project in in uh, Honolulu, and I just visited that about four weeks ago when I was back home, and it's 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 exciting to physically see it coming out of the ground. By the way, to Mr. Valadeo's uh, comments, um, we can no. uh, we can certainly uh, lend some uh, expertise uh, at this point in terms of your leases uh, throughout the country, having done battle on those issues 
Um, and so thanks, we, we got that one done, but um, you're correct. The system itself needs to be corrected really to accommodate some of the unique qualities of VA leases. Um, I, I wanted to go back kind of nationally um, to the cost of healthcare in the VA system as a driver of your budgets. And you you rightly noted that this was a concern and you, <clears throat> you attributed it to three factors. Uh, one was just general inflation in healthcare costs across the country. Uh, number two, the, the specialization of VA healthcare to a broader range of services, which comes in many cases at a higher unit cost, I guess you could say. Yeah. And then finally, you talked about a vote of confidence and demand um, on, on the system from that perspective. And so I, I took by that that you meant just more people in the system yeah. uh, because it's not a supply demand equation in the sense of you know shortages yeah. equal higher cost per se. Um, it's, it's just, is that, is that correct, first of all? That is that is correct. Yes. Okay. So, do you know what your general assumption was in in the but overall assumption on healthcare inflation for the budget itself? Um, because I was trying to I was trying to piece it together here to figure out exactly, you know, whether you are within the realm of reasonableness in terms of of keeping up with healthcare inflation. I, I guess I would hate to be in a situation where your your inflation calculation was somewhere down at three or four or five, even five percent versus what's actually happening. Uh, I think it's a fair question and it's a logical question. This is the second one that I should have actually uh, should have been ready for that I'm not. Um, so let me take and find out what does what we, we have a actuarial table, an actuarial model uh, that we work these through. Uh, I don't know what the base uh, assumption on healthcare inflation is in that, but I'll get you that and I'll get it to you by the end of the day. Okay. Yeah, I think I think it would be benefit all of us because we obviously have to evaluate whether, whether the budget is going to encompass those costs. And then related to that, you know, I don't think any of us would accept that we just have to kind of take it on healthcare costs. And so the, no. the real, the real question is, is with the VA expanding, not only its volume of services or volume of, of, of patients, but range of services, you're, you're really encompassing under one roof, one collective roof, a much larger a portion of the overall uh, healthcare provision in the country. And so you obviously have, you know, economies of scale and you have negotiating power and you have the ability, I think within the VA umbrella to actually affect those healthcare costs yourself. Yeah. I, I think of them a standard model and it's a, you know, it's an issue that we've been arguing over in Congress for a long time about whether Medicare should be able to negotiate for bulk purchase of drugs. That would be the clearest example in the VA um, has abilities, but have you, I mean, what is the status of kind of the bigger picture effort to use your size and extent and weight to actually influence the, the inflation where that's not really a particularly, um, thus far at yeah. least, effective option uh, beyond the VA? I think it's a super interesting question. Uh, there's, um, you know, th there are places where we can exercise some increased influence almost not entirely as a price maker but uh the place where we are most influential is on our drug formulary and because we can negotiate uh we see significant drug savings and veterans are um sophisticated consumers of health care many veterans have several options some have tricare for life some have va some have Medicare, and some come to us for different pieces. Many come to us because of the very competitive pricing on our uh, drug formulary. And I think that's a direct combination of our skill among our workforce uh, in developing that formulary and because we can negotiate. Another place where we're trying to exercise and increase our economies of scale is on the supply chain. We have a project called Dimmels where we are hopeful that we can uh, generate some economies of scale by pooling uh, uh, purchasing power with Department of Defense on things like uh, PPE. Uh, there's complications there. We have, uh, we, there's, we have requirements in statute that we give uh, uh, preferential access to veteran-owned businesses, small businesses. Um, so we're working that through, but there's two places where we can test this new model. One is in North Chicago in a joint Navy VA facility, and then one is in the Northwest of the United States in what we uh, call Vision 20. 
it is not working near as well as I hoped it might. Uh, we'll, uh, by the end of this year, have something to report to this committee and to the other committee up there, the authorizers, about where we stand on supply chain and getting economies of scale. Yeah. Third, uh, the last thing I'd say here is we're a price taker in a couple of important ways. Uh, if we don't uh, get more competitive on wages for providers, we're going to lose providers. So what you gave us in the omnibus for nurses is really important, but we need relief on medical center or hospital CEOs. We need relief on uh, specialty doctors. We re need relief even on things like what we can pay and how many housekeeping people we can hire. Uh, so we'd, we'd like to be able to be in a position to be more competitive there or we're going to lose people. Last thing is an increasing amount of, going back to the Mission Act in 2018, an increasing amount of our care is purchased in the community. That number, the CBO anticipated it would be quite large when they scored this back in 2018, as I understand the debate. I was not here at the time. We are outrunning those estimates for what we're paying for cost in the community, or sorry, for care in the community. Uh, this is a place where we're a price taker too. And uh, we're getting better at being a payer. We used to be late uh, and not accurate in our payments. We're better now. And I'd like to see us begin to use innovations like those available under the Affordable Care Act, like pay for performance, like bundling, uh, now that we've established ourselves as a good payer in the community. Um, we'll see if we can get there um, because this is a, uh, an increasingly large part of our budget, the amount of care that we're referring uh, veterans into the community to get, which obviously uh, we're gonna have to get under control over time uh, if we're hoping to get these kind of healthcare inflation numbers under control. I hope that's a responsive question, uh, a responsive yeah. question, Mr. Case. You absolutely did, but uh, a lot more to a lot more to go along these lines, lots, a lot of good um, avenues, but thank I uh, apologize for the time over, Matt Chair, and uh, I provoked it and uh, uh, I reeled back. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. The gentleman yields back. Um, Mr. Rutherford, you're recognized for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you very much, and, and uh, Mr. Secretary, it's great great to see you, and, and you. Uh, I can tell you, I'm being from the Jacksonville, Florida area, uh, and having seen the the recommendations, we are very excited uh, about the medical facility uh, plan for our area. Uh, but it is a very diverse uh, type of uh, district. A very urban core there around Jacksonville, where we have yes. a, a massive number of of uh, veterans living. Then we also have some very urban. Uh, or I'm sorry, rural areas, and and I'm, I'm I'm curious not so much about my district, but but overall, when the when the commission starts to look at equal or better, uh, the con uh, within the context of things like telemedicine, which uh, quite frankly I'll tell you I, I was not a big fan of prior to COVID, uh, but I think they've kind of won me over. Uh, so when, in the context of equal or better, uh, which is the goal, I, I understand, um, uh, also, so, so that's one element, uh, right. but the other is this community, uh, community care that we were just talking about, uh, under the Mission Act, do they perceive VA, VA facility care? Uh, to, you know, when they make those comparisons with the community providers, uh, you yeah, know, I think it's also important that we look at equal or better there. Some of the challenges that we're having uh, in, in my district particularly uh, is, and you mentioned the, the large usage uh, by veterans of the community care model and, and uh, that it's even exceeding the expectation. I can tell you it would be even bigger, I think, if we could get those referrals in on time, uh, because there's there there are some real delays 
coming out of VA on getting these referrals uh, into some of the community care. So when we talk about equal or better, I, I think we ought to be looking at some of those challenges as well, not just the accounts receivable, which is which was yeah. so bad in my district that, as you know, we actually had providers yeah. that refused to work with VA. Right. So can, can, can you give me your opinion yeah. on, the, on those issues? Yeah, thank, Mr. Arthur, thank you very much. And and I think uh, just a, one broad, uh, uh, well, two, two broad questions, and then I'll get to the, the access, timeliness of access. One is, I think Florida in general, Texas, uh, Nevada, Arizona, California, um, North and South Carolina, what we saw as we looked at the trend lines for veterans over time uh, in these market assessments is that uh, vets are moving uh, south and east, south and west, and due south. And uh, so that's one of the things that we're wrestling with as a system. But importantly, in the recommendations, we remain in every market as a central coordinator of an integrator of care for our veterans. Uh, no matter if you're in Florida or you're in Minnesota, uh, we are staying in every market. That's one. Two is the, the baseline, kind of the first cut of <clears throat> whether to maintain a facility or build a new facility uh, or modernize a facility in a particular market was average daily census. How many veterans are in a facility on any given day uh, in, for inpatient care, for example? Mm -hmm. And so we set a cutoff of 20 ADC, average daily census. And well, I didn't, with the team uh, going back to 2019, set this 20 person census and under that we take a harder look over that we see this is a facility that needs to be modernized however i believe that there are certain communities underserved some in urban settings one in particular was in alabama for me some in rural settings one was in montana one was in kansas where the recommendation came to close that facility I thought that was a mistake because the availability of other providers there was low. And historically, there were not new providers coming in. Which means my third point, how did we assess quality? We looked at Medicare and Medicaid ratings for hospitals to make a determination of, is it better, is it equal or better if somebody gets referred in the community? If there was not a good facility that our providers felt good about, we wouldn't do it. Lastly, on timeliness. Uh, if, if you look at our average wait times across the system, they're good. But it's a big system and we're coming out of pandemic. So I fear that there are outliers uh, where people are waiting too long. So we're constantly trying to get better at finding them and get them into uh, referrals quickly. Secondly, how we measure the wait times, uh, I think we got to do a better job of that. And so we're working that through now and we'll talk with you and with the committee about that. The last point, and I know I'm going over time, but we can't keep, we, we have to understand the impact of the pandemic on referrals as well. Because of the pandemic, almost now every veteran it meets the standard to be referred into the community. But not every veteran wants to be referred in the community. Uh, and so we have to work that through on an individualized basis. But because of the pandemic, where so many facilities, you know, for a period of, uh, for safety reasons, uh, you know, withheld care, we are in this place where uh, managing that casework inevitably means more people going to the community question is, are they going to come back to the direct care system or are they going to stay in the community? That's a big question for us strategically. Thank you, Mr. Secretary and Madam Chair. I, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rutherford. Um, Mr. Secretary, I think you're right about, uh, particularly about the, um, how we calculate wait times. Yeah. It's been a, a, a consistent problem and yes, uh, and inconsistent across the board and 
I hope we have some news for you in the next uh, in the next period on that. We're working really hard on it because I'm I'm frustrated with it myself, to be perfectly honest with you. I just worry that we send too many veterans out of the out of the system because the the wait times are not calculated really accurately. Yeah, and it, it may cut both ways too. So, well, but we we owe you that work, and we'll get it to you. Thank you. Um, okay, Ms. Pingree, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and I'll add my best wishes to you. Hope you recover quickly. Uh, Secretary McDonough, it's so nice to have you before us again. Thank you for Thank being you. with us here today. I want Thank to talk you. to you a little bit about the concerns I have around military sexual trauma. But before I jump into that, I just want to say I had the great um, good fortune a month or so ago or a couple months ago to visit in the Portland Seabock as it was opening. Um, and what a wonderful facility. You know, we spend a lot of time uh, talking to the VA about, you know, how um, underserved our veterans are and how bad some of our facilities are. And to see this incredibly modern building with, you know, state of the art care, um, all of the room you could possibly need, really thinking about every possible concern that a veteran could have to respect their privacy, to make it comfortable. Um, you know, I commend any member of this committee who wants to see what a really great facility looks like, come and visit that facility, you know, and have a lobster while you're there. But um, uh, I, I just can't even begin to describe it. And the, the fact that you could sit in the dentist chair in there and be looking out at the ocean and just sort of the idea of how calm that would make you feel and how valued that would make you feel. So I'm taking up way too much of my time, but I just want to say that was great. that was great. It was a wonderful moment to see that. Um, but let me jump into military sexual trauma because it's a long and complicated topic. And I know we've discussed it before, but I'll try to Summarize quickly, um, we discussed the 2018 OIG report, which found that 49% yes. of MST-related disability claims were inaccurately processed. And unfortunately, in August, there was another report, um, and to summarize, it said 57% are not processed correctly. So the error rate is going up. Um, I guess I want to know your reaction to that, what actions you're taking, and let me just throw in a couple of other things. I have a bill, Service Members and Veterans Empowerment and Support Act which would improve the claims adjudication process. And it basically deals with this notion that currently only veterans with a PS PTSD diagnosis are eligible for relaxed evidentiary standard. Um, but a different diagnosis, which is common with MST, like anxiety or, or depression, those aren't eligible. So I've gotten some feedback from the VA on the bill, uh, but I would really like to work with you to move this forward. You know, Unless you have another plan for getting these numbers up, um, we just have to make sure that all the veterans filing for compensation for mental health condition related to MST have access to the same relaxed evidentiary standard. Yeah. I think that would help a lot. So uh, I'll let you talk. Good. Well, thanks very much. And, and I, I appreciate uh, the attention you pay uh, to this issue because it's it gets to what, something else I think you saw at the Portland Seabock, which is uh, we also have to make sure that our facilities and our programming and our decision making is uh, reflective of, hospitable to, and welcoming of uh, the fastest growing uh, uh, demographic, which is women veterans. Now, it's not just women who are uh, survivors of MST. Uh, it is women and men. Uh, but how we do on MST claims uh, sends a really important signal to our women veterans who are survivors and to our uh, um, men veterans who are survivors. So here's what we've done uh, year to date. We've adjudicated 10,179 MST cases. They, uh, that's a 70, and we've granted in 78% of those cases. Now, it could still be that we are not uh, uh, granting rightly in the 22% that are not getting uh, the claim, uh, whose claim is not being found uh, in favor of. Um, but the way we're trying to get better on that is we've consolidated MST claims into eight regional offices with spe specific teams with experience on these claims. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, better understanding of understanding how to resolve these claims. Um, we 
Uh, so that's been since May 2021. Later this month, we're moving to a virtual regional office that handles all of these cases and just these cases. And that will be run out of San Juan. So uh, I hope as we specialize in these cases, we get better on the error rate. The last point is we are constantly trying to get better. We're in the midst of this month of a, a full training effort and updating effort of our claims providers. I think we're in touch with you. I know we're in touch with one of your colleagues on the authorizing side, Ms. Luria, about coming to help us as we're thinking about this. But as you say, we also have to be constantly updating our clinical practice. I just saw a big story about the fact that, by the way, standing to reason, survivors of uh, military sexual trauma are more likely to have hypertension. Hmm. And so we ought to be factoring that new science and those new findings into our practice at VBA as well. So all of this is us trying to get better. All of us is all of this is us trying to incorporate more uh, science uh, and more understanding of the phenomenon into our practice. And uh, you're keeping the pressure on us uh, by maintaining the, the attention on it uh, helps us as well. We just got to get this right. Okay, I'm out of time, but I want to um, when we get a chance, I want to, you know, push you a little bit on the evidentiary standard as well, because uh, and uh -huh. I greatly appreciate the the training and the thought you're giving to this, but we'll, we'll get a chance to work on that and talk to you about that as well. So Good. thank you back, yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Pingree, and thanks to you for your advocacy on this important issue. Um, the gentlelady yields back. Um, uh, Mr. Bishop, you're recognized for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you, Secretary McDonough for appearing before the committee today to discuss your FY23 budget request. Uh, as a veteran who represents a sizable veteran population in Midland Southwest Georgia, I appreciate your service uh, to our nation and to Thank our you. veterans. Thank you. Uh, and I'm looking forward to hosting you in Columbus, Georgia for the opening of the new state-of-the-art Porter Chef Clinic. Uh, the veterans in Columbus and the Chattahoochee Valley deserve the finest Healthcare we can offer, and I'm glad to know that they will be getting this new state of the art clinic that they can use for decades to come. Uh, I supported the VA Mission Act uh, that required your department to provide recommendations to the Air Commission, and I believe the department has made a good faith effort in conducting market analyses that compared the current health capacity to the expected future need. Uh, however, the Government Accountability Office recently published a report that identified several shortcomings in the data collection methods that were used um, are not, because they were not done uh, uh, before the pandemic. They, I'm sorry, they were not done since the pandemic. Right, uh, right. So while we know that tough decisions will need to be made, we can only properly do so if we know that the data is reliable and predictive uh, can you commit to following through on the GAO's recommendations to improve the completeness of that uh, community care data uh, and to communicate uh, to the commission the information about that data's reliability and the, and the updates uh, used in the assessments? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Bishop. I, I really look forward to the trip down to Georgia myself. I, I really appreciated the time we got to spend together last month. Uh, we, you know, uh, I appreciate the GAO study. Um, I had actually commissioned a red team to look at the market assessments uh, a couple months before the GAO study. Uh, red team of healthcare experts, uh, both VA healthcare experts as well as general healthcare experts, because my fear was that the market assessment data was dated, so much of it going back to 2019. That red team told me and told us, and I shared it with our uh, committees, you all and uh, the authorizers, um, that indeed, as we feared, the data is dated. And so without any other option, because there is no delay option in the statute, uh, the statute's quite clear on what we need to do, we have devised a program going forward where we will update that market assessment information and provide it concurrently to the commission as it's meeting. I wish I could have ensured I had the benefit of better data on which to make my recommendations. Mm -hmm. But 
you know, the statute being what it is and, you know, I don't get to choose which laws I follow and which I don't. Uh, I had to proceed as I did. So I hope that we can get them. I, I we intend to get them updated, timely information on which they can assess our recommendations. And so you have my commitment on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me shift quickly to the Carl Vinson uh, VA clinic in Dublin, Georgia, yes. uh, which uh, recently had a lapse in sterilization protocol and exposed several thousand veterans to potential exposure uh, yes. to bloodborne illnesses such as hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV. Uh, yes. Can you provide us with an update on uh, how the VA responded, corrective measures, uh, alternative service providing, uh, provision that was given, uh, any testing results, uh, and whether any of the uh, ill in, any of the veterans contracted illnesses, and whether or not uh, the uh, facilities were uh, dis the use was discontinued, and if so, when will that uh, use uh, resume? Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Bishop. Uh, yeah, this was uh, obviously a, a very troubling development, uh, but as a highly reliable organization, uh, we at VA uh, got to the bottom of it. Uh, you know, we uh, we became aware of a potential challenge. Uh, challenging situation where uh, sterile processing equipment uh, was not used appropriately uh, or was not uh, deployed appropriately uh, to, you know, clean um, surgical and other equipment, um, colonoscopy equipment, for example. Uh, we contacted every vet um, who uh, would have gotten care uh, and been exposed to that uh, equipment in the window of concern. Uh, we have had many vets, I don't have a specific, the specific numbers, but I will get you those before the end of the day. How many vets who have come in uh, to get tested uh, for the blunt board illnesses that you just listed and others to make sure that they weren't uh, exposed. Um, so far, we don't have no evidence of anyone having contracted any of those diseases. Programming at the facility was suspended, uh, but I, I, uh, I'm embarrassed to admit to you, uh, Mr. Bishop, that I, I don't know if it has restarted. I believe it has, but I'll get you that concrete answer also before the end of the day. Um, but the, the uh, sterile processing service had been suspended uh, for a period. I think it is back now uh, running again. And uh, anybody who needed to be referred to a different facility or into the community in the meantime uh, was accommodated, obviously, uh, consistent with clinical best practice. Thank you. I think my time has expired. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. Um, Mr. Trone, you recognize five minutes of questions. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and uh, please feel better, please. Um, Secretary Dunham, it's wonderful to see you. Uh, we are so fortunate uh, to have you leading the VA. I tell all my constituents, we just got a home run there. Uh, the time we spent together, uh, unbelievable. Uh, the CBOC, uh, Congresswoman Pingree talked about, we toured a CBOC together, state of the art. Uh, just great to have these uh, throughout the country. Uh, the work on the Air Commission, it's going to be fantastic. The changes you'll make and address things like Congresswoman Lee brought up uh, since COVID, but that work overall, we've got to get behind it, support it, and, you know, be there and not be, uh, not be political on it, but just do what's right for our vets. Thank End you. story. I, I know it's not going to surprise you, but my questions focus on mental health. Uh, the new 988 line is fantastic, activated in July. Um, it's especially important given the Army uh, lost more active duty members to suicide in 2021 than we have since 2001. So we really need this 988. And my question is, the first question is, your budget request states the 988 expansion is going to lead to one and a half million more calls. And how are you, are you, what help can we do to help you? Do you need help on recruiting, you know, yeah. retaining employees? America's faced with this great resignation that we've seen, hard to get psychologists, psychiatrists, therapists, hard as a Dickens to get them. Um, do you feel good about that? And then also, if you have to shift people, 
we have so many other important things uh, that you're working on, suicide prevention. Yeah. How are you going to get it all done, and can we help if needed? Yeah. Mr. Secretary, if you could just pause for one moment. I have to quickly go vote in the Oversight Committee. Ms. Lee, if you could take over the chair for a moment. Um, the next person to, to ask questions uh, will be me uh, when we go around again, to the, but I'll be right back. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairwoman. Thank you, Ms. Lee and uh, uh, Mr. Trone. It's great to see you. I, I really enjoyed our visit uh, in Montgomery County and up into Frederick County. Uh, I think it was great. I think that uh, CBOC in uh, Gaithersburg is a classic example of the kind of access that I think everybody's been talking about from uh, Ms. Lee to Mr. Rutherford to Ms. Pingree, uh, including that we're providing gender specific care in that facility. Uh, there's not a full time gynecologist, but there is uh, gynecologic access um, expertise specializ specialization on a regular basis there. Uh, that's what our fastest growing de demographic of women vets expects. That's why the president's budget uh, anticipates the largest ever investment uh, in uh, gender specific uh, care for women vets. Uh, that's why he's asked for that money in this request. And I'm really looking forward to the opportunity. On uh, 988, uh, you're right uh, that we're, uh, our budget anticipates fully uh, implementing the 988 uh, switchover. Uh, we'll be, uh, f you know, s some uh, providers have begun using it. Um, we will be fully switched over as of July 16 of this year. As you said, we expect call volume to increase 122 to 154%, meaning the Veterans Crisis Line could see an additional 835,000 to 1,054,000 ,000 calls for a total of as many as 7, 1.7 million calls. I gotta tell you, this Veterans Crisis Line, the team there, I am so proud of them. I'm so impressed by them. That is very difficult work. Many have been doing that from home, uh, you know, working all day, going upstairs with no distance from work, going straight to dinner, the dinner table. Uh, I cannot tell you how proud I am of them, how inspired I am by them. We, went, we began hiring up for this effort uh, last year. Uh, and we need to increase our full-time equivalents or our workforce by 460 people. We anticipate needing uh, 2,568 employees on the veteran crisis line. The way you guys can help us to give us this budget, we have the money uh, and the billets and the authorities in the budget to get it done. Period, full stop, next paragraph. You're absolutely right that also all of those other specialists, psychologists, psychiatrists, therapists, uh, our counselors in our vet centers, which uh, the vet center is an absolute gem where we're providing constant uh, quick access to mental health care for our veterans. Uh, we just need more mental health professionals. And we've talked about this in this committee before. I've talked about it with the authorizers as well. Uh, we envision uh, uh, partnerships with HHS and with DOD, uh, including through USHUS, which I think is also in your district, Mr. Trone, to make sure that we are turning out more mental health care providers. Until we do that, we'll just keep moving Peter and Paul among different health care facilities. We'll go from DOD to VA to colleges and universities to community hospitals. We just need more mental health professionals. And uh, that's going to cost us money, and we just got to get on it. And congratulations on eliminating the three copays also. That's another great step to get our vets comfortable to come in and say, I need some help. So Agreed. Same problem it presents, though, unfortunately. Yes. Yeah, we just need more providers. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Lee, thank you very much for uh, You're the... welcome. <laughs> I'm back. Um, and the gentleman yields back, uh, Mr. Secretary. I, I think um, a few of us might have another round of questions, and uh, we, we should wrap up by by twelve thirty. Our our planned 
end time, if that works for you. Um, I, I uh, want to begin by asking you, because I know you know that the committee is focused very seriously on increasing investments in women's health, and that's been a priority for you as secretary, uh, because we need to ensure that the VA is dedicating funding specifically for women's needs. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to see the budget request $767 million for gender-specific care and another $134 million for the programmatic office. Can you talk about how this funding will be used to incentivize women veterans to get their care at VA, to make them feel their needs are met, to address longstanding concerns that women veterans have raised about issues like harassment at VA facilities, never mind the military sexual trauma that some of them may have been through, uh, and also the lack of providers. And then are, are you proposing efforts to expand the care and services that VA offers to women veterans with, this, with these resources? Or is your focus more on outreach to women about the services that are available? Yeah. So uh, I think there's like a combination of uh, if we build it, they, uh, they will come. I, we just talked a minute ago about a visit that I took with uh, Mr. Trone uh, with Senator Van, Van Hollen to uh, CBOC right here in Gaithersburg, suburban Maryland, where we're providing uh, mental health, primary care, uh, gynecology services, uh, mammography, uh, so there's a certain amount of this, and this is uh, and this is underscored in the president's budget, that we need to provide the services that women veterans want and need. Uh, so the uh, women's health programming uh, budget allows us to invest in the technology, equipment, that is, and the people. So specifically, gender specific care providers uh, to ensure that in our facilities, we provide the services that vet women veterans want. One. Two, the context and the atmosphere in which we provide it is critically important. So sadly, uh, very often we uh, have found it productive to uh, provide a separate entrance to the women's health pavilion or the women's health clinic so that women don't risk being catcalled or approached and saying, hey, are you here with your husband? Or are you here because your dad is a vet? When in fact, the fastest growing demographic of veterans in the VA system are women veterans themselves. So the context in the environment, the milieu is important. The budget also recognizes that. And, you know, as we saw in Gaithersburg, as we see in the DC VAMC, we have separate, including uh, we have innovations, including separate entrances for women vets. I hope we quickly get to the day when that's not necessary, but it is still necessary now. Lastly, specific programming is also really important. So, for example, uh, Eliminating the, the budget envisions eliminating copays for birth control. It's crazy that uh, we it, it, it is a missed opportunity for us to demonstrate how much we want women veterans in our care if we continue to charge a copay for birth control. Relatedly, we have an antiquated way of how we uh, f uh, fund uh, reproductive assistive reproductive technologies, including IVF. So our budget envisions uh, and plans for changing the current statute uh, and practice that ties DOD, sorry, VA to DOD practice that uh, requires, uh, limits us to only providing uh, assistance to uh, married heterosexual couples and uh, limits uh, our ability to provide services uh, to um, uh, to veterans uh, in certain uh, with with certain uh, conditions so uh, we just have to do a better job of this the last thing is we also envision fixing this permanently as a new authority, rather than continuing to fix it year by year, recognizing, uh, on fixing it year by year on your bill, on an appropriations bill, recognizing that the reproductive cycle does not happen on the fiscal year. 
And so we just have to get be beyond the situation we find ourselves in. Um, we're also uh, incidentally looking at the motto uh, because of, I know that this continues to be a source of frustration for many women veterans. I hope that's responsive to the question, Madam Chairman. Yeah, thorough, thorough, a thorough response. I appreciate it. Um, and I appreciate your proposal to finally decouple the, uh, the, the VA's IVF policy um, because it's inequitable uh, and it doesn't make any sense. And we really have to make sure that across the board, there's equity when it comes to access to health care for our veterans. Um, yeah. uh, apparently, there's a, 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 another vote that I have to go back to core with. Um, Judge Carter, you're recognized for five minutes. I will be back before uh, before your, your five minutes is up. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, there are more than 22,000 veterans in Texas enrolled in the VA's burn pit registry. About 4,200 of these live in my district. So I ask, excuse me, I'm not sick. On their behalf, I appreciate your continued efforts to address the needs of the veterans exposed to toxic substances. In addition, the additional investment of $225 million for claims processing, healthcare services, and research will do a lot to get, of good for those people. Yeah. What does the research show about the long-term health effects related to these, to these toxic exposures? Is there a direct link between exposures and rare cancers? Are there chemicals that we know cause cancer? Does the VA or DOD, uh, do the VA and DOD cooperate on research and investigation of this issue? And what have you learned from the review conducted last year on the process VA used to determine a service-connected condition? Judge, thanks very much. Uh, let me start with uh, the burn pit registry itself, um, which I think has been a source uh, of frustration for many vets. I know it's a source of frustration for me. We have to do a better job of making sure that vets who uh, sign up for the burn pit registry uh, get an opportunity uh, to uh, that, that we get in touch with them and that we start getting data from them. I think too many have lingered without hearing from anybody. Oftentimes then those who do get an opportunity to, to be seen don't actually get a, a full clinical exam. So we, we have announced over the course of these last couple of weeks that uh, people who are on the registry and come in for an exam and want a full clinical exam will ensure that they get that. That'll be a challenge, but we I think we owe that to them. Uh, we, uh, we are, I think, making good progress on a new model for how we establish presumptions. Uh, we, I anticipate uh, sharing that new model with uh, the committee later this spring. Uh, the model is, we've finished our work on it internally at VA. We've now shared it with the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House where they'll use their independent expertise to validate or not our model for how we consider new presumptive, uh, f presumptions for service connection of certain conditions with toxic exposure. Um, an important part of that, as it relates to your question about whether we collaborate with the DOD, an important part of that is an interagency process run by the White House that includes DOD, VA, HHS, labor, and sub sub agencies or sub components of each of those departments around the one table we've now met seven times since i've been here to make sure that we're sharing best available science and we're generating new science to answer unanswered questions and it's based on that collaborative basis rather than just waiting for not the national academies of science engineering and medicine to give us literature reviews we're leaning on that interagency group to generate additional science. And it's, it's a, based on that that we we're able to make the three presumptive connections that we did last year, sinusitis, rhinitis, and asthma. And it's uh, 
partly based on that process that we are in the process of rulemaking on nine rare respiratory cancers. We anticipate uh, finishing rulemaking here sometime in the near future. I got to be careful what I say about the rulemaking process, I think, uh, so I won't say much more than that. But over the course of this year, we'll also then look at lung cancers, brain cancers, and constrictive bronchiolitis. Uh, a new, uh, you know, where we're developing new technology, by the way, to identify that very ill-defined, though debilitating condition later this month in the National Journal, uh, the New England Journal of Health, uh, sorry, of Medicine, there'll be a report from uh, two of our clinicians and researchers about constrictive bronchiolitis and how we diagnose it. So we're all, we're full speed ahead on this, uh, Judge. Um, I feel like we are making uh, good progress on it, uh, but my um, guess is you still feel hear some frustration from your vets in Texas and Round Rock. I know that I still hear frustration, uh, and we won't uh, rest until we get to the bottom of all these uh, these claims. You know, I had an experience with Agent Orange. Uh, my brother-in-law I was a Vietnam vet pilot, and uh, the Air Force, went on to be a Delta pilot and retired from Delta. And then he got a brain cancer. They call it a ghost cancer. You find it in one part of your brain, you treat it. It looked, seemed to disappear. And then it would pop up someplace else. Mm. So there's a lot of treatment. And uh, I mentioned to Kurt, my brain, actually, my wife mentioned it, Kurt. Could all that be caused by Agent Orange? And the typical, I think, response from a, an awful lot of veterans, all oh, they never stayed where I was. I don't hmm. worry about it. And uh, then Kurt went to a VA website and he saw the map of where the spray was. Tuiwa Air Force Base in Vietnam was the second heaviest area to protect the aircraft. So then he looked at your sheet that tells you all the little cancers that were available. And sure enough, I can't tell you what the, all I know ghost cancer, right. I wouldn't call that, but it was there. The fact that the VA came in stepped in and took over the medicine part of the treatment he was getting at Sloan, Sloan Kettering in New York. It was a great godsend great. to my, my brother-in-law's family. He was one of the great guys I ever knew. And so I commend you highly for the, for the great things you did for Kurt Brown, my brother-in-law. And but he was a typical American warrior. He just assumed he wasn't anywhere where that happened. He just yeah. had bad luck. But you were there for him. And so and I'm afraid this a lot of people are assuming these burn pits are gonna be questionable. But I'm not sure. So we gotta be on top of this. So the That's guy right. that ever something really bad wrong can have a place to go look. That's right. I I, I couldn't agree more, uh, Judge Carter. And I just say one thing is uh, too often uh, I hear the same thing that I heard about Mr. Brown, which is uh, the vet assumes that, well, it didn't happen to me or I don't want to go in because I might take somebody else's care or, you know, somebody's worse off, off than me. I, I urge our vets to please come file a claim uh, and let us work this out. It's not going to come at the expense of anybody else. We'll We'll get to the bottom of it. Well, thank you for that, that very great story. And in New York City, that's a big problem because it's a big city. Yeah. And, and the, the big VA place is over in Brooklyn. But very quickly, we got, got service, and I was real happy about that. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. You're back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back, and Judge Carter, um, appreciate your sharing your story about your brother-in-law and it's it's just 
a lot more of this, I agree, is uh, is pretty cut and dry about the impact. It'd be hard to comprehend how burn pits could not have a, a detrimental health impact on veterans. Um, and I know the secretary firmly agrees with that as well. Absolutely. If, if there's any words I know I can put in your mouth, not your mouth, Mr. Secretary, it's those. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Pingree, you're, uh, you're recognized if you have a second round. Five yes, nine. I do. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and again, thank you for uh, your continuing attention to our questions. Um, uh, one last thing on the MST. Uh, I just wanted to mention that um, we hear a lot of veterans um, about the lack of quality and their discomfort with the comp and pen exams, um, particularly those that are not done through the VA. Uh, about 10% look like they're done through VA providers. I know in Togus in Maine, 106 exams were done by contract providers while just 22 were performed in-house. I'm sure some of that happens because you're trying to you know, move the process more swiftly, but um, we hear from a lot of people would really prefer if they had the opportunity to, to ask for their uh, in-house, their exam be done in-house by a VHA provider. So I, I want to get to another question. So I'm just going to put that out there on the list of things like evidentiary standards. And I hope we can, uh, we can follow up and, and just pursue uh, that. Count on that. So one thing I really want to get to is um, PFAS. It's a, it's a major issue in Maine right now. We've got a lot of uh, challenges going in our agricultural sector because frankly, we've been um, forward thinking about looking for PFAS and um, and so we've we've seen a lot more than we wish we had, but we also um, know that happens um, on military installations. And uh, we have the Brunswick Naval Air Station in my district, so we're familiar with some of the issues that could happen regarding a military installation. Um, I know the DoD has identified hundreds of these around the country that potentially has hazardous PFAS. And I just have concerns that we're not doing enough to address the exposure with the veteran population who have served this. Um, installations. You, you touched at, on the idea of a VA's new pilot model in your testimony for dealing with military environmental exposure, and it specifically mentioned that you're increasing your veteran outreach. Um, but we hear a lot from veterans about the installation that they've served at, where they may have lived with their families and that they've tested, uh, that the facilities tested for higher levels of PFAS, so they're concerned about their own health. But could you expand a little bit on what the VA's efforts are to improve outreach? Um, and whether they will include outreach to PFAS, um, expose veterans? Yeah, so we're, we're trying to expose, or, or as it relates to toxic exposure generally, we're trying to increase out, outreach, and that's through all of our standard uh, ways um, to include making sure that, uh, for example, as I said, when somebody takes the, the step, the, uh, the step of filing for the burn pit registry that they actually that they see some result there from I think in too few cases that's been that's happened heretofore. Um, so I'll give you I, I, why don't I take uh, for submission to you kind of what our comms plan is with veterans around toxics and around PFAS. That's one. Two, this is a major priority for the president and he stood up for the first time in the interagency working group on PFAS. And you can imagine that obviously EPA is a key mover and shaker in that, but so is DOD and so is VA. And uh, we're working very closely with the Council on Environmental Quality and OSTP, as well as uh, you know uh, the DPC at, White, at the White House to make sure that as a government, we're looking at this holistically. So this we share uh, your concern about it. We're trying to get our hands around it as a government uh, and an administration holistically. And VA has a fundamental role to play in that as well. Great. Well, I will follow up with those uh questions that we had for you. I know there's a lot of other people who want to ask questions and your time is limited. So I'll yield back, but thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and I look forward to working with you on these issues. So thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Uh, General, General Lady yields back. <clears throat> Mr. Valadeo, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I had a teletown hall last night and one of the top questions, and I mean, it came up a lot uh, was homelessness uh, and obviously the issues that we're having that in the country. And I know that you can't address all of them, but uh, I'm encouraged to see that the president's budget includes a total request of 2.7 billion for veteran homeless programs. Can you elaborate a little bit on how the programs, the VA plans to use these, uh, this funding increase for and specifically the, uh, for veterans in rural areas like my district? Uh, I'm specifically interested in 
continued investment in mental health and uh, the HUD DASH program. Yep. Uh, thank you, Mr. Valdeo. Uh, this is a major priority for us. I know it's a, a major uh, challenge uh, for uh, California. I know it's a challenge in Bakersfield. Um, uh, we have set a goal this year to get 38,000 veterans, homeless veterans into permanent housing this calendar year. Uh, after January and February, we're at about 4,500. At that rate, we won't meet my goal. Uh, I'm told, but I have not yet seen the March numbers. Um, but I'm told that those numbers are accelerating off of the J January because of Omicron, February coming out of Omicron, relatively slower months. Um, that's the goal. The question is, how do we do it? Uh, we have a strategy that I think has been proven over time, and in fact, proved by uh, the fact that we were able to, as a country, reduce homelessness among veterans by half from 2009 to 2016. And we call that strategy housing first. So we have to get a vet under a roof before we can expect the vet to begin to address the issues that may have led him to be homeless in the first instance. As you say, mental health disorder, substance use disorder, joblessness, uh, uh, being involved or justice, uh, justice system involved, being in, involved with the justice system. Um, uh, our whole strategy is get uh, vet into housing first and then make sure that we provide the wraparound services that helps him stay in housing. Sometimes that means getting a house, uh, a, VA, uh, a veteran into a transitional house. So maybe get him into residential treatment for substance use disorder or get him into a tiny house as for example on the greater Los Angeles uh, 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 facility in LA, in West LA before we get him or her actually into permanent housing. A lo the long pole in the tent on permanent housing, I'm told, is not just housing stock. It is case managers to ensure that landlords understand that when a vet has a HUD VASH voucher, uh, that they can have the full faith and confidence in Uncle Sam meeting the obligations of that voucher. And too often we have landlords who are suspicious or are un, uh, di, um, misunderstand how the voucher works. So it's got to be incumbent on us to ensure that we explain. Uh, and when we do explain that to landlords, including in high demand, uh, low housing, high demand areas like Southern California, it actually works. So we've set a goal, and this will cut across into rural communities too, to reduce the time it takes to exercise a voucher to 90 days. Uh, we want to make sure that in half of all cases where we get a vet into permanent housing by using a HUD-VASH voucher, we execute that within 90 days. Now, that, strike, that may strike you as slow. It does strike me as slow. But frankly, in some places, including in LA, for example, because of the complicated nature of both our programming and the housing authorities, the overlapping authorities, um, 90 days is pretty fast, which brings me to my last point, which is we just need to make sure that we are using all of our authority to get caseworkers on the street on individual vets cases. And that's in Bakersfield or in rural communities and in LA proper. And you, there's an authority that's available to us that says, if we are not filling those case manager jobs with government employees, then we need to go fill them with contractors. So we're exercising that contract authority now in the hopes that that gets us more people on the street and therefore getting more people using their vouchers in a more timely way. Yeah, I appreciate that, especially the contractor perspective, because that was something that we really struggled with. And I know we've talked about that in previous uh, hearings. So appreciate yeah. the answer. And uh, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Valadeo. The gentleman yields back. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mr. Trone, you're recognized for five minutes. Oh, 
Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just had one more quick follow-up. Um, I've got a second CBOC up in Western Maryland, uh, really called in Hagerstown, sort right. of the heart of the area where there's so much addiction and opioids and a lot of mental health distress. And most of my vets come from that rural area. I have 43,000 yeah. vets. And what's it take time-wise, just a best guess from taking a CBOC that's been there that it's kind of antiquated and, and they made a decision to close it and then opening up a brand new CBOC which they made a decision to do so. What's the time frame it takes to, to do that? It's a good question. Uh, I can get you, why don't, why don't I get you a piece of paper, uh, Mr. Trone, that kind of lays out like how, uh, not how a bill becomes a law, but you know, how a building becomes a new CBOC. Uh, we must have that. And that will be better, uh, more informative than what I can give you. So I'll get you that today. But let me just ask for your help on one thing. And I raised this earlier. A lot of times the CBOX are in leased buildings. So, you know, not even new buildings that we built and uh, or new buildings that are built that we then lease back. Um, you heard, uh, you might've heard Mr. Case talk about this. Uh, and uh, you, you would have also heard of, uh, I forget who else raised this earlier. Um, oh, uh, Mr. Valadeo in Bakersfield. It is so frustrating. Uh, once we get through our internal project by project prioritization list, which we have to work, you know, geography by geography, a lot of factors go into that. Um, it's called the skip process. Once you get through that and then you want to go lease a building, we start all brand new because of the way we have to get legislated authorizations for each individual lease and then CBO scores it in some outrageous fashion that ends up meaning uh, that we are now 31 leases behind going back to 2015, 2016. So there's this big tail at the end of that process in a place like Ayer Sound because of the way we do our internal business that delays these uh, buildings. In some cases, you know, in Honolulu, it was almost a decade. In Bakersfield, it's approaching a decade. And so we just have to fix that. And I think we can fix it on the toxic exposure bill that the Senate's now considering that you all voted on a couple weeks ago. And I hope that when that gets a conference or wherever that goes, we can make sure that this lease fix is included in it. Uh, no, that would be a huge win. Um, as you know, I have a business background. I've done hundreds of leases all over the country. And I know what it takes from when you find a site to you get it open and it is a slow, tough process. And then you add government, <laughs> God bless you on top of that. <laughs> <laughs> so my concern in Hagerstown is they. I spoke to the folks and we're you know we're connected together. They've got one year left on the existing lease, and they're highly confident they'll be open and running in twelve months. And I was a bit skeptical, and so I just want to make sure we don't have a, a loss of care uh, if they you know if they can't get this twelve months turnaround yeah. done, and then I can maybe get an extension on the old lease. So I take care of my constituents. Well, we'll make sure we'll make sure that that, that there's no slip from cup to lips there, Mr. Trone. I'll, I'll look into this specifically. If if they uh, we are very once all the rigmarole is worked out, we're highly efficient at getting into the new building. So let me just check into it, and I'll get back to you. But I, I uh, I'm 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 confident that I can I can give you assurance that we're not going to have a slip from cup to lips there. We'll make sure that there's no no. Um, uh, uh, loss of services. Awesome. That's all I have. I yield back. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Slip from cup to lips. Is that a Minnesota expression, Mr. Secretary? I think that might, I think I got that from my mother who is from South Boston. So I don't, I, I think that might be Boston. <laughs> That's not a Long Island expression. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, um, excuse me. Let me just uh, get my, let me get my act back together here. Too much talk about Long Island. I know. You can never talk about Long Island too much. Okay, Mr. Rutherford, uh, we're not going to talk about Long Island. We'll talk about Jacksonville now. You recognize All right. <laughs> thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and uh, 
You know, I, I have to say, I have always considered it um, a great pleasure to serve with Mr. Trone because he is so focused on mental health. And I can tell you as a former police officer, um, I too have had a great focus on mental health uh, almost my entire adult life uh, as a result of what I had to deal with. And so when I came to Washington, uh, one of the main focuses that I had was actually helping our veterans with their mental health issues and getting the PAWS Act passed uh, so that these therapy dogs could help our, our veterans. Uh, we succeeded finally. Uh, maybe it took Mr. Trone coming up here to get it done for us. But, uh, but we, we, we got that passed. And, and I know, Mr. Secretary, that this is a concern of yours, too. Um, and, and so when I see, you know, I know February 21st was supposed to be kind of like the go live date for implementation of, of uh, this program. Uh, we're, it looks to me like we're running a little behind. Now, I, I know they said, well, they've selected some sites, but we don't have any um, agreements, contractual agreements signed yet. Uh, and, and I know this is a, 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 of interest to you as well. So yep. can, can you tell me how much longer do you think it will be before we can actually start, uh, start these programs and start helping our veterans. Yeah, look, I, I think, uh, I, I th you know, the president's budget envisions, uh, obviously, fully uh, funding Paws Act, fully funding the Sergeant Fox uh, local gr grant program, I think, mm -hmm. uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, enacted in the John Scott ha uh, Hammond uh, uh, mental health bill a couple of years ago. These kind of innovative new uh, community level programming uh, options are really exciting opportunities for us. We see them as such, but we're also relatively new at grant making of this type in those communities. So we're, we're, we have been quite deliberate about it. We, I think, just announced a week before last the five pilot sites. Right. Um, I think you are right that we have not yet then landed uh, the contracts uh, from RFIs uh, or RFPs in those five sites. I don't, I don't have this, I, I, I'm embarrassed to say this now for the third time, I don't have the answer to the specific question for you, but I'll get you that answer today as to when we can expect those awards to be made in those five pilot sites. And then importantly, when we can expect the programming to start. So I, I'll get you that answer by the end of the day today. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary, because I, I have a lot of people, um, you know, in in Jacksonville, particularly because we have Canines for Warriors, which is in yep. my district, and um, they're very active, and, and we are eager to go to start helping, uh, you know, our veterans around the country. Great. So th thank you very much, and with that, Madam Chair, I will uh, yield back. Thank you, Mr. Rutherford. Um, I I think my own window is closing in a moment. <laughs> I'm trying to hold it together here. Uh, Ms. Lee, you're recognized for five minutes. Okay, uh, hopefully this will not be the full five minutes, but uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Secretary, as the former chairwoman of the Technology Modernization Subcommittee, I'm obviously feel very strongly about the rollout of the electronic health records modernization. Uh, and since your 12 week week review um, uh, last year. Uh, mm -hmm. We've seen the rollout in Spokane still have some continued dif difficulties. And I know you inherited this problem and we certainly do appreciate your team's uh, regular updates on this issue, uh, but some problems still remain and we need That's to ensure that the VA addresses them quickly and effectively, especially with these go lives in Walla Walla and Ohio uh, coming on this spring. And so I just wanted to ask, how does the uh, FY23 request of 1.76 billion account for the ongoing issues we've seen in the rollout at Mann Grandstaff and Walla Walla? 
Yeah, thanks very much. So uh, that we that we this is a slightly smaller request uh, than I think was anticipated um, in the initial. So the first thing is it recognizes that the rollout is much slower because of uh, how challenging uh, man grand staff has been. Let me just say publicly again how much I appreciate the work of our uh, team on the ground in man grand staff. They've done. Uh, really important work in helping the rest of us understand the nature of this challenge. Uh, the second thing is um, we, you know, the, we just had three more IG reports. Uh, we uh, have uh, closed those um, recommendations back to the IG uh, and man grand staff, but we're still going to keep learning from that. And we stay, we're staying in touch with the man grand staff team. Uh, I know they just testified in the house yesterday, many of them, along with Walla Walla professionals. And I know the deputy will be going out there soon uh, to meet with them, I think later this month. Third, uh, Walla Walla is only 10 days in, but it's going actually uh, on the higher end of expectations. That doesn't mean it's been flawless, but we're rolling. And that's because we learned the lessons from Spokane. Uh, and the same will be true in Columbus at the end of this month, and then as we go to no, new facilities after that. But what we're going to do is let the data and the expertise drive this. We're not going to try to force some timeline. Uh, we're going to try to learn lessons. And between, you know, Kurt Del Bene as our uh, Assistant Secretary for OINT and as Dr. Terry Adiram as our uh, program lead, uh, we're taking this very, very seriously. Uh, we're learning the right lessons, and we'll stay on top of it. Great, thank you. And then, um, you know, back in my facilities in the district, I've been hearing uh, a lot of concerns and struggles with outdated IT infrastructure. Uh, this has resulted in difficulty in being able to deliver services to veterans, but also has opened up the VA to cyber vulnerabilities. And in fact, I recently just introduced a bill uh, to improve VA cybersecurity. And, how does your budget request aim to uh, secure these much needed technological upgrades at the VA uh, in advance of these further rollouts? Yeah, thanks very much. So we're asking for $400 million uh, for cyber. Uh, it's an $80 million increase over last year. Uh, so this is a very serious priority for us. We're obviously in instituting uh, the president's uh, plan for us to get the zero trust architecture. Uh, we won't do that all in this budget, but we'll, we'll get uh, good ways down that uh, chain. And uh, this budget, which is, you know, uh, we've had important but modest increases in IT infrastructure over the course of the last couple of years. Uh, this includes uh, important upgrades of the kind of uh, material that you've had frustrations with in your district. Um, and importantly, the uh, infrastructure modernization program is funded by this uh, request as well. So it's a big uh, priority for us. We frankly need to continue those increases in the out years, uh, but we feel good about this request. Great. Thank you. And that's all I have. Thank you for your time. Mr. Thank Secretary. you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lee. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, that concludes our, our budget hearing, and we just really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you, and the, uh, I, I have to commend you on how thorough uh, your responses have been, um, how responsive your responses have been. Um, that is not always the case in this budget hearing, and um, sometimes these hearings are a wrestling match, and instead, this one was uh, collaborative, like it should always be. So Great. on behalf of the committee, I, we, we appreciate it. I'm sure that, uh, that we'll have more questions in the future and look forward to working with you as we move the Milcon VA um, chairs mark through the process. Thank with, you. With that, uh, you're welcome. And I thank uh, all the members for their well wishes and understanding um, my spluttering. So with that, the hearing stands adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.